Hello, Christine, and welcome. Um, Hello. It's such a pleasure to have us uh, to, to have you here with us today. Um, thank you very much for joining us. Um, I will begin by um, saying a few words about you, introducing you um, in the third person. Uh, Dr. Christine Meyer teaches German studies at the Université de Picardie Jules Verne in Amiens, in France. She leads the research group Circulation des idées de savoir et de texte, Monde germanique et autres aires culturelles, at the Interdisciplinary Research Center, Centre d'études et de contact linguistique et littéraire. Her research interests include 20th and 21st century German language literature, specifically intertextual and intermedial practices, transcultural phenomena, minority literature, post colonialism, canon and canon critique and the intersection of literature and memory studies. She has worked on Elias Canetti, Paul Celan, Friedrich Glauser, Elfriede Jelinek, Emine Sevgi Özdemar, Rafik Shami, and Feridun Zaymoglu. She wrote her doctoral dissertation on intertextuality in Elias Canetti's work and her professional professorial dissertation on the ways in which Rafik Shami Feridun Zaymoglu and Emine Sevgi Özdama write with and against the canon of German literature. The latter became the book Questioning the Canon, Counter Discourse and the Minority Perspective in Contemporary German Literature that was published last summer in the De Gruyter series Culture and Conflict, which is edited by Catherine Nessi, Paolo de Medeiros and Isabel Jill. Thank you very Thank much you. once again. We are absolutely delighted to hear more about your book um, I know it's it's very difficult to summarize years of research and a 300 page long book in a few minutes, but um, could you tell us in brief what your book is about? Um, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, my book examines uh, how German language literature um, from writers with what had, has come to be called a migration background, have reread and reworked canonical literary texts. Uh, for those writers, as uh, for writers in the post-colonial context, to work on the canon is to work on history. Uh, it is a way of negotiating their relationship to the nation as a whole by challenging its foundational works uh, of literature. Uh, yet, post-colonial approaches have long been perceived as less relevant to, the, to German language literature than to Anglophone or Francophone uh, literature. And this is partly due to some peculiarities uh, of German history. Um, Such I will as, say a few yeah. words about it. Um, first, there is the fact that uh, Germany had a much shorter uh, colonial history compared to other European uh, countries. Uh, it lasted only, uh, so to speak, uh, 40 years. Then um, uh, there is the belatedness of German nationhood. Uh, Helmut Plessner famously defined Germany as the verspätete Nation. Uh, Germany emerged as a nation only in 1871 a factor that shaped the relationship between nation, people and culture in Germany, and subsequently the understanding of German citizenship. And so there is the notion of Kulturnation, which is very important here. Uh, the third um, point, uh, of course, is the traumatic memory of the Nazi period, uh, much shorter still than the colonial period and the subsequently central place of the Holocaust, in Germany's relationship to its own history and to its identity as a nation. Um, the memory of that period tend to somewhat overshadow the memories of German uh, colonial domination, which nevertheless uh, was very, very brutal and left a profound mark on the way uh, post-war Germans relate to non-European others. <laughs> Um, then uh, there is the fact that immigrants who came to Germany from the 50s on were not former subjects of the German colonial empire, but rather from countries that had either um, uh, been colonized by other European powers or had never been colonized at all, such as Italy, Spain and Greece, and 
uh, later Turkey, and after 1989 uh, from Eastern Europe in Russia. Uh, and finally, there is the fact that reunification um, uh, of Germany in 1990 saw uh, a rebirth of nationalism and of thinking in terms of the national at a time when nationhood was generally thought uh, to be a thing of the past. Um, so an intellectual grappling with the legacy of German colonialism uh, did not take place. And uh, post-colonial studies only crossed paths uh, with German studies belatedly uh, in, in recent years. The literature of migration, as it is called in a German context, has therefore never been viewed um, from a post-colonial perspective. Um, it is true that outside of Germany and in the US especially, some scholars have very fruitfully applied um, post-colonial concepts in reference uh, to the work of the native German language authors. Um, I'm thinking here of Leslie Adelson, uh, Petra Fachinger, Azade Zeyan, uh, and Stuart Taberner, among others. But there remains a lot of work to be done uh, to change the way non-native authors writing in German are other um, and to challenge the institutions that continue to treat them as outsiders. Uh, so my book aims to show uh, what such work with, um, in and against the national uh, canon consists in. To do so, I mobilize methods and concepts uh, from different uh, research paradigms. I draw, for instance, on post-structuralist theories uh, of intertextuality and palimpsestic writing, um, and um, mainly uh, leaning on uh, the works of Gérard Jeunette. Mm -hmm. um, then I engage with the idea of post-colonial authors writing back uh, to the German, uh, to the Western canon, uh, excuse me, um, an idea introduced by in um, Bill Ashcroft, Garris Griffiths, and Helen Tiffin's groundbreaking book, The Empire Rides Back. Uh, I also engage with notions borrowed from literary sociology, uh, such as Pierre Bourdieu's uh, literary field, and uh, more recently, Jérôme Mezot's conception of authorial posture, posture, mm -hmm and uh, Ruth Amosi's conception of discursive ethos. And finally, I place uh, the emphasis, obviously, on the context of literary reception uh, rather than literary production. And that is an approach advocated by scholars researching phenomena of cultural transfer in German studies. And I'm thinking here uh, of uh, Michel Espagne and Michael Werner. Mm -hmm. So, um, as to the authors, my book focuses on three non-native writers of German language, uh, Rafik Shami, Emine Zevki Özsama, and Feridun Zaymuru. Um, all three of them uh, come from the Muslim world, so Syria and uh, Turkey. Uh, a biographical detail which raises controversial questions of legitimacy, integration, and accountability in the German context. Uh, and yet all three are not typical migrant authors. Um, Shami is not Muslim, but Christian. Özdamar is female and uh, from an educated upper middle class background. While Zaymoru, Muslim, male, Turk and working class by birth, is the one to most fervently maintain his Germanness. Um, the three authors belong to different, if overlapping, generations, but they mobilize and re-semanticize canonical uh, German texts in their work uh, in creative and often uh, subversive ways. Thank you so much for this overview. Um, it's interesting that Özdemar being female is, uh, is uh, her female, being female is an atypical uh, feature of of um 
her profile as a as a migrant author, as it were. Um, so could you give us a very brief historical overview of what um, of what is called uh, least controversially non native uh, German literature? Uh well, it is rarely uh, called like that uh, in the German context, <laughs> I must say. Uh, so as the first migrants came to Germany, um, the first migrant workers who were called uh, Gastarbeiter, guest workers, um, as they began to write in the middle of the 70s, uh, their production was very marginal and it was perceived, um, if it was noticed at all, through the lens of documentary and politically engaged work. Um, these early texts um, were written out of criticism and outrage about inadequate working, living and housing conditions. Um, they addressed issues of uprootedness, loneliness and the racism of German society. Um, and the term itself, Gastarbeiterliteratur, um, which has been coined by the authors, um, uh, interestingly, was in itself already a means of responding to the German canon, insofar as it aimed to connect um, to the Marxist tradition of workers' literature, Arbeiterliteratur, mm -hmm. right. which had been popular under the Weimar uh, Republic. Um, uh, so... Um, as this first generation of immigrant authors started uh, living by their pens, their topics shifted away um, from the guest workers' world. And those who followed hadn't been guest workers themselves. Um, and so their production didn't quite fit into this category um, uh, at all. And it didn't quite fit into that of Ausländer Literatur either. Uh, but Although they increasingly wrote books which hardly distinguished themselves from um, uh, the production uh, of natives, they still weren't perceived as mainstream by the public. Uh, so a new category had to be created. And at first it was Migrantenliteratur, migrant literature, then more abstractly Migrationsliteratur, literature of migration. And from there we gradually got to interkulturelle literature, the most popular to date, um, uh, or transkulturelle literature, transnational, or even hybride literature, hybrid literature. And this so it gets ever, ever more euphemistic, as it were, yeah. uh, but also ever more politically correct and ever more... Yes, but open. It, it, it's ever less meaning, <laughs> meaningful, you know. Uh, so this terminological debate became an ongoing issue um, uh, among critics, journalists and scholars, uh, so much so that it has tended to dilute uh, the very question of whether writers with a migration background still need to be assigned a category of their own and provided that they actually constitute a separate group, despite their different origins, outlooks, and aesthetics, why that is. And uh, what is it has to do with the way the German society looks at them. Um, so meanwhile, uh, a specific literary award was created for them, the Chamisso Prize, called after the French-born aristocrat Adalbert von Chamisso, um, Albert de Chamisso de Boncourt, who had fled the French Revolution and become a famous German romanticist. Uh, this distinction was created in 1985 and it, it helped uh, to promote many important books, among uh, others, uh, those of Chami, uh, Zamoglu, uh, and Özdama. It was but abolished. It, right. Yes. I, I was going to ask, it was yeah. recently abolished, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, 2017, um, on the grounds that it had achieved its goal. Um, right. Literature from foreign-born authors, it was assumed, no longer needed any affirmative action to find its public. Um, and that is partly true, but it doesn't really um, change the situation. Right. Yeah, so um, so in, in some ways, uh, there, there, is, there seems to be an alternative or... Competitive uh, 
canon from from what you said um emerging um a transnational canon if if uh, you will but um kind of going back to uh, the the beginnings of your thinking about um about the german canon what what would you say the german canon today looks like what authors would you say it includes um well, first, I must say there has been a, a, a huge debate on the question of the canon in Germany um, after reunification. And uh, many people ask themselves, what is the German canon? What should exactly. it be at the turn of the 21st century? So I, I explain uh, why there is has been this debate and what it is about, but I don't provide uh, any a priori definition. Um, uh, of what the canon is, it is um, a prescript. There is a prescriptive canon, and there is a, um, a perceived canon. Uh, what I do in the book is to propose a classification. Uh, mm -hmm. We need a classification, and there is a classification that emerges empirically uh, from the works on the ex examination. And um, this classification is, of course, very cursory. Uh, on the one side, uh, there are the representatives, as I call them, representing what um, we can call a major line, um, the dominant or conservative canon. Uh, on the other, uh, the rebels or outcasts, those whose canonicity is constructed from a subaltern, progressive or marginal position. Uh, itself emerging from underprivileged social conditions or um, Jewishness, for instance. Uh, so this is the minor line. And then there are some borderline cases um, where it depends on the way, uh, on which part of the work and the way you're looking at them. Uh, so could you so mention some examples? Yes, yeah. thank you. On the ma major line, obviously, we find authors like Goethe and Schiller, who, who are uh, on the cover of the book uh, as a statue. Um, then, very important, the Brothers Grimm, and uh, some other popular romanticists and post-romanticists. Uh, on the safe, same level of canonicity, we only find um, uh, representatives, non-German uh, authors of the mm. Western canon, such as Shakespeare, uh, who is practically a German author too? too. Uh, yes, since as far the, as Germans the, are concerned. <laughs> yes, of course. Um, and um, uh, there are some operas to uh, who, uh, um, uh, which Ozama uh, uh, especially relates to, such as Puccini, Mozart, um, and Smetana, and others. So even oh. there, there is an appropriation at work, an appropriation of, of other canons or canons in other languages, uh, as it were. But that's that's probably a subject for a whole other book. <laughs> yeah. uh, and then on the minor line, uh, there are authors like uh, Lenz, uh, Büchner, Heine, Kafka, Celan, uh, Canetti too, Brecht, uh, as Alaska Schüler. So there are, among them, there are uh, revolutionary authors and um, all of the Jews practically, um, uh, which are per definition on the minor line. And uh, uh, finally, we have the unclassifiable, uh, ambiguous, um, uh, canonized authors, um, such as Friedrich Hölderlin, um, mm -hmm. the novel uh, novelist uh, Jean Paul, uh, the romanticist um, Etia Hoffmann, um, Kleist, and Chamisso himself. Right, Very so, short. <laughs> um, it's a uh, short and it's uh, quite male, apart from mm. um, Laska Schüler, um, yeah. whom you mentioned. But um, Going back to the main argument of your book, how would you say um, that the German minority uh, writers or German language writers that you um, that you explore in in your book, how would you say that they relate to this canon? Especially since, as you just 
described, this canon is not clear cut, it's not singular, it's, it, it consists of multiple lines. Mm -hmm. um, well, as could be expected, <laughs> there is a broad spectrum, um, ranging from appropriation to resistance, from grafting to rejection. Um, so on the positive side, Side, the canon reception of non-native authors follows a logic of appropriation based on adhesion uh, to shared values, mm -hmm. um, which is similar to what can be observed in cultural transfer. In migration literature, this always amounts to some kind of denaturalization or de-ethnicization of canonized texts, so as to emphasize the aspects that do not fit with the ideology of uh, the Kulturnation. And such appropriation uh, has a legitimizing function, but also a hermeneutical value. The challenge uh, is to impose a change in outlook on uh, fetishized creators and their works. Um, uh, for example, uh, Elsa Laskashuda, the uh, uh, expressionist poet, uh, Jewish woman who um, uh, emerges in Özdemar's uh, Strange Stars, the Stare Down to Earth. Uh, she emerges between the lines as um, a model of uh, self orientalization. Um, and so, an, an example, a possible example for uh, women who um, really uh, come from the East today. Uh, such as Özdemir uh, herself. And uh, there is uh, something comparable with uh, going on with Goethe uh, in Charmy's secret report um, uh, on the poet Goethe or in Zaimoglu's Love Marks, Scarlet Red. Uh, but there is also an, an oppositional tendency, a head-on counterattack uh, of the marginalized creators against a uh, hegemonic power. Um, under attack here is the nationalist ideology sedimented in the canon, uh, mainly romantic and post-romantic, um, understood as a predatory and totalitarian structure of thought connected to the structure of colonial domination. And the context here is, uh, of course, the resurgent of a nationalist rhetoric popular in the aftermath of reunification. So there is an actual uh, uh, present concern about it. Yet each of those dynamics had, um, also has its reverse side. Rejection of the canon is tied to some amount of uh, adherence and appropriation always has a critical subtext. Um, in short, authors unpack uh, the national uh, mythology constructed by literary historiography in order to delimit a territory for themselves. Thus, they lay claim on one part um, of uh, the national heritage because they are challenging another. And it is only because they adhere to one tradition that they can afford to oppose another uh, or the dominant social discourse about any issue at all. Um, and so their approach to the canon may as much be defined as a writing in or writing with approach as a writing back. Right. So um, how, how would you say that the political dimension of this writing in and writing with can be articulated? Um, and more broadly, what is the political dimension of, of your work? Um, uh, yes, there are um, there are several um, uh, perspectives, several levels. On the strategic level, uh, the canon-related discourse of non-native uh, writers always implies, as I already said, a strategy of legitimation in view of the marginal position of these authors um, within the literary field. Uh, on the ideological level, the author's subjective approach to the canon is part of a social and cultural context in which any positioning on their part on this issue assumes a political dimension, whether as provocation or 
um, allegiance in term in terms of the German nation's projections of identity, uh, as well as in terms of public discourse, uh, for instance, on Islam, integration, uh, and the East-West um, East uh, relationship. So at both levels, nothing, uh, we can say, that uh, nothing that uh, non-native authors say about the canon is free of political implications. Uh, no matter what they say about uh, the literary tr tradition of the Germans identify with, the challenge they pose to the majority society lies in the very fact um, that they allow themselves um, to act as if they were legitimate inheritors, so beneficiaries uh, in the legal sense of the, of the word, of the German and more generally Western um, cultural tradition. And that is a big problem uh, for a system uh, based on the idea of a cultural gap between us and them, um, East and West, Europe and the Muslim world. Um, a system that likes to assign the foreigners uh, at best the role of informants about their culture of origins. Um, uh, through the myth of our authenticity. Um, so um, a system which sees the others as intercultural mediators. And this, so that uh, is political yeah. in itself. Exactly. This makes a lot of sense uh, to me, the idea that nothing that minority authors or non-native authors say about the canon is, is free of political implications. And perhaps we could even generalize this to say nothing that they say publicly is free of political implications. They are as public persona, personas. Um, they are politicized um, sometimes despite their, um, their best intentions. Um, mm -hmm. So I think this has uh, become clear from uh, what you've told us about, about your book and your argument in your book so far. But what, what would you say is the contribution of your research, your intended contribution uh, to German studies with, with this publication? Uh, well, such essentialist way of thinking um, in terms of us and them uh, is deeply, deeply rooted in German society, as I said, um, and more generally in Western society, of course, but maybe in Germany, it more easily goes unnoticed because of the absence um, of a colonial and post-colonial mm -hmm. history comparable to other European countries. And thus, uh, a form of uh, paternalistic othering is present even uh, in the academic field. Um, many universities have created entire departments devoted to intercultural studies, uh, where the accent lies on bridging the gap. Um, and this ethn ethnological framework, uh, we could say, is widely used to analyze the works of minority writers, while it is not uh, in relation with non-minority writers, which, which would be legitimate um, uh, in that uh, configuration. So my book questions this approach. Um, the assumption that cultural uh, differences um, really matter, um, so that they have that much impact both on society and uh, on literature. Uh, and uh, I am highlighting instead um, the social and political issues at stake in uh, what is a relationship between majority and minority, um, between national institutions and individual artists. Um, and the epistemological gain that results from this shift um, of perspective is not limited to the study of minority literature alone. It calls for a decentering of the academic approach to national literatures on a whole. Um, which, of course, I'm not the only one uh, to defend. Uh, I, I, again, um, think of Adelson, Taberna, um, Axel Duncker in Germany, and, and many others. 
but this is a collective effort this decentering yes. uh, yes. of the of the nash of, of national uh, literature is, is a collective effort um so about about this term the term na national national literature or national literatures in the plural do you think it it still has any pull to it um it often seems um to be a bit of a spectral term so it, it's it's been contested so often as 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 you just mentioned as well but it it seems to be so tenacious um and it's still in use not least in public yes. discourse um <laughs> uh yes literary historiography has to be decentralized uh, obviously and to some extent denationalized uh, i i myself wrote a book which is called post nationalist uh, well, there are subtitle uh, post nationalist uh, perspectives um uh, but i i wouldn't call it like that today um and this process of decentralization is already underway, um, thanks to scholars who have promoted the idea of cultural transfers and transnational dynamics uh, in literature and culture. Um, yet, as long as there will be nations, and we see now how important it unfortunately, unfortunately still is, um, there will be national literatures. Um, because national dynamics remain crucial both in society and in the literary field. There is a market, a national market. Um, uh, and in German, German history and everything that has been going on uh, in German society in the last decades, reunification, uh, the rediscovery of a national sentiment and so on, uh, are of critical importance uh, for the reception and production of lit literature, as we see in the text. So, uh, no, we need it. <laughs> still need it. We need, and it's, it, it's still, it's still there, whether we like it or not. We no, still need I, to work. I like to to point to to Stuart Taberna, who says transnationalism and the nationalism is as important as the trans in this approach and, mm -hmm. and that is really and uh, i think uh, uh, important well thank you so much for giving us uh, this insight into your book christine uh, and for your thought-provoking contribution to what i think is one of the most exciting areas of research in in german studies today um and for our viewers and listeners you can find christina's book questioning the canon counter discourse and the minority perspective in contemporary german literature on www.dekreuter.com thank you very much thank for you. listening thank, thank you. you very much to you <laughs>